In April 2014, officials in Flint, Michigan switched the source of the city's water from the Detroit water supply to the Flint River. It was a cost-saving move, but it touched the lives of citizens across that city. Today's guest helped blow the story open. With science and determination, she proved the decision was poisoning the children of Flint. She's Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha this week on Story in the Public Square. Welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. To do that, we sit down every week with the best storytellers around, authors, journalists, filmmakers, and more, to make sense of the big stories shaping public life in the United States today. To help us this week, we're joined by Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, the crusading pediatrician in Flint, Michigan, who helped confirm the city's water crisis. She's written about it in her book, What the Eyes Don't See. And she's with us in Providence today because of the Rhode Island Center for the Book, who selected What the Eyes Don't See as its selection for its annual statewide read. Dr. Mona, thank you so much for being with us. It's great to be with you. So for those of us who don't, uh, maybe haven't read the book or have, uh, don't maybe only know tangentially what happened in Flint, what happened in Flint? Well, what happened in Flint is a water crisis. So in 2014, in really kind of a corrosion of democracy and a, a move towards austerity, we changed our water source to the local Flint River to save dollars. So we went from Great Lakes water, um, which we had been using for about a half a century, to the Flint River um, to save money. And the Flint River water wasn't treated properly. It was missing an ingredient called corrosion control, uh, which made it about 20 times more corrosive than the, wa than the water we were getting from the Great Lakes. Um, and that corrosive water ate up our pipes, which had lead in it. Um, the lead began to flow into our drinking water and into the bodies of our children for about 18 months. How did you find yourself in the middle of all this? Um, a lot of the, my kind of involvement happened by serendipity. Um, so I happened to be um, home with a high school girlfriend who, of all things, was a drinking water expert. We've been friends for about 20 years, and our kids were running around and playing together, um, having a glass of wine. And she's like, hey, Mona, um, have you heard about what's going on in Flint's water? And I'm like, you know, I've heard about what my patients are concerned about and what I hear in the local media, color and odor and taste and bacteria. And I've also been heard, hearing a lot of reassurance from state officials that the water is is okay. Um, and she's the one that shared with me that the water wasn't being treated with this important ingredient. And because of that, there would be lead in the water. Um, and from that very moment, you know, my life really changed um, because when a pediatrician hears the word lead, it's, it's a call to action. Well, so why is lead so bad? Lead is probably the world's most well-studied um, neurotoxins. We've known what lead has done for centuries. It is potent, it's irreversible, it's a poison. Uh, incredible science over the last few decades has gotten us to the point of recognizing that there is no safe level of lead in a child. And its dangers are mainly in, in what it does to children. It really impacts the core of what it means to be you, um, impacting cognition, so it actually drops IQ levels, impacts behavior, leads to things like developmental delays and attention disorders and focusing problems, and it's even been linked to things like criminality. Um, so what we're supposed to do in medicine and public health is something called primary prevention. We're never, never exposed, supposed to expose a population to lead because what it does to children. Oh. So you talked about this was done to save money. What kind of money, what, what sums were being talked about that we would save by going to this new source of water? Yeah, so Flint was in this state of near bankruptcy, and we were under the control of a financial emergency manager. And at that point in Michigan, many of our cities, our predominantly minority cities, were, were taken over by emergency managers, all to, to save dollars and to kind of balance the books. Um, so there was a lot of cost cutting that was happening by these emergency managers. They were, you know, wanting to, you know, sell off our public hospital. And in Detroit, where it happened, Seriously? yeah, in Detroit, they wanted to sell off our um, Detroit Institute of Art. 
efforts, and that kind of finally saved that city from its its bankruptcy <laughs> state. Um, so it was the savings were in the order of millions. Um, the, the Flint was buying its water from Detroit, the Great Lakes water, and they were fed up with paying Detroit. And you know they thought that they could save money um, by moving to the Flint River until a new pipeline was to be built to the Great Lakes. So the move to the Flint River was supposed to be temporary um, until a new pipeline was to be built. And I think the savings were in the order of, I don't know, like 20 to 30 million dollars. And the greatest irony in this story is that this treatment chemical that was missing, this corrosion control, only would have cost eighty to a hundred dollars a day. That's all it would have cost. Could, to nobody foresaw this in the planning. I mean, this was not done, you know, on Mars. This was done in this America is, in a in a major state near a major city. So you know, this is. And this is why it is so mind-boggling and why I really felt compelled to write this book, because this was happening on American soil yeah. in the 21st century in the richest country in the history of the world. Right. And of greatest irony in Michigan. So Michigan's the mitten state. We are surrounded by... Water. 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 Yeah. We're surrounded by the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes are the largest source of fresh water in the world. We, like, wherever you are in Michigan, you're like an hour away from fresh water. Um, and here's Flint, literally in the middle of the largest source of fresh water in the world, in America, in the 21st century, and where we, uh, you know, where, where bureaucrats have made the decision to save money by, by going from a high quality water source to a lower quality water I mean, source on I, the backs of poor and minority people. I mean, I just have an image of these bureaucrats, whoever they were in a room totaling up the dollars yeah. from boom to yeah. ching to yeah. ching and oh by the way the health mm. exactly there was there was no consideration of children's health environmental health public health well you one of the things that I love about this book and I really I really love this book the uh, the role of the emergency managers uh, you know this is something that a lot of municipalities across this across the country have dealt with in the last decade and a half uh, but you you argue that this is is about the diminution of democracy. Absolutely, this is probably the most egregious examples of what happens when we take away democracy. Literally overnight, Flint lost control of our locally elected officials, and we became under the control of somebody who just reported to the governor who had no accountability. Um, and that's why this story is not an isolated story. It really speaks to what's happening across our nation in regards to the breakdown of democracy. This is no different than efforts at as, as voter suppression and gerrymandering and mass incarceration. These are all different ways that democracy is being taken away from some of our most vulnerable um, citizens. And as you said, we're the richest society in the history of our species. It's, it's words fail me. So how did you get involved writing about it? You're a pediatrician <laughs> by training. Had you done any writing before? Or, or... So... By the way, pediatricians along with primary care people are like sacred. <laughs> <laughs> uh, seriously, uh, they're, they're it, like, you know, in terms of healthcare, they are the most important pieces, I think. It is a privilege to be a pediatrician. I absolutely wake up every day and I pinch myself to be able to care for, for my kids in Flint. And it's, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful profession yeah. um, where you can do a lot of science and service, but a lot of advocacy. Advocacy is very much part of our work. And a lot of prevention, as you said. Prevention. It's, it's a critical piece of it's this. Our work is embedded in public health. It's, yeah. you know, it's not as much about the kid in front of me today, but it's really about the promise and the potential of that child, what's going to happen to that kid in, in 5, 10, 15 years? That young brain that's getting poisoned by lead that will never be the adult brain it could be. Exactly, because what was happening in our water was really threatening the tomorrows of all of our children. Um, so, you know, as to being a writer, so I grew up a reader. Um, I always kind of devoured books as a child. Uh, reading was really kind of the, the religion of my family, um, being being well read. Um, I was the publisher of our high school paper. I, I, I literally publisher, but not editor. But, but, uh, maybe it was editor slash publisher. <laughs> I don't remember. I like publishers, yeah. so don't yeah, get me yeah, wrong yeah. here. <laughs> so um, uh, went on to college, and you know, I actually my undergrad major was more like environmental science. I started out as like an environmental activist organizer. Um, really really started to understand the connections between environment and health, um, but then really also got immersed in creative writing classes, um, stayed another year in college really to take fun things, fun classes like creative writing. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, reading and writing have always been a passion, and I strongly believe um, that no matter what profession you go into, you need to be a good writer. 
Talk to us, if you can, about the, the title of the book, What the Eyes Don't See. So when I first started reading the book, I'm like, I, I don't, I'm not sure what this is. Yeah. But you very quickly explained that really is a central theme mm -hmm. to, to, to the book, but I think more to the way you approach medicine, too. Absolutely. So what the eyes don't see means many different things, and I, I look forward to readers kind of digesting it on their own and finding the many, many kind of themes that, of, of that title. Um, so at first and foremost, it means the quite literal. So we don't see lead in water. It's invisible. It's odorless. It's tasteless. If you remember those pictures from Flint, that kind of brown water, yellow water, oh, yeah. that, that was from iron corrosion because the iron pipes were also corroding and that gave you that rust colored water. But, but lead in water is, is invisible. We don't see it. Um, we also don't see the effects of lead. Um, you know, back in the day when, when we had lead and paint and gasoline, children were presenting to our ERs with seizures and coma and, and could acutely die from acute lead poisoning. And a lot of that came from paint. From oh. paint and gasoline. And gasoline, um, yeah. But the, we don't see those high levels anymore. What we see right now is something called a silent pediatric epidemic. It's asymptomatic. Children, people think like, oh, you figured this out because kids were coming to your clinic, right? with problems. Um, th no, th that's not what was happening because the symptoms of lead exposure are asymptomatic. They're subclinical, which actually makes it more dangerous. Like I wish kids would present with like a glow in the dark spots, then we know <laughs> that they're exposed <laughs> to lead and we could do something about it. But unfortunately it's, it's asymptomatic. So we, it's, it's a silent, we don't see the consequences of lead exposure, if not years or decades or, or generations later, um, which makes it so much more harmful. Um, in addition, the title really, the first time I heard that title was when I was a, a doctor in training, when I was a pediatric resident, and one of my supervising doctors, um, an, an attending in our intensive care unit, would really drill us um, at, at the bedside, especially if we couldn't figure out a diagnosis. And he would always say, the eyes don't see what the mind doesn't know. And it's a it's a D.H. Lawrence distillation, um, really telling us and reminding us that, hey, we need to read more. Um, you need to study because you're not gonna diagnose something or pick up something if, if you don't even know that it exists. And that kind of speaks to my blindness because I never even knew about the possibility that lead could be in water, um, which really, shows how kind of eyes closed I was because the word lead actually means plumbing. Um, lead comes from the Latin PB, which comes from plumbum, which means plumbing. So so the word lead actually means huh. plumbing. Um, but the, the bigger meaning of this title, What the Eyes Don't See, um, it goes way beyond Flint. It is about people and places and problems that we choose not to see. Um, and it is really, I hope, I hope that this book is a rallying cry for all of us to open our eyes. Um, but it is not enough to be awake. It, it is more important to act um, to, to, uh, towards the injustices that are happening all around us. We're going to get into that a little bit further in, but you were one of the first to sound an alarm here. What was the reaction when you publicly brought attention to this? Yeah, so I was actually kind of um, late in the story. So the water crisis had been going on for like a year and a half. Um, and I, I, I think of it like a series of dominoes, like the, the heroic and brave people of Flint, they knew something was wrong and they were loud and organized. And then there was really incredible journalists who were on the story. And, a, and it was known that it was lead. No, no, they didn't it know it was lead. Okay. They knew that there was something going something on. Something was going on, but right. we weren't sure what. Right, and um, something not right. But something not right. What, I mean, like right. just a few months after we switched our water source, General Motors, which was born in Flint yeah. and still has plants in Flint, noticed that this water was corroding their engine parts and they were allowed to go back to Great Lakes water. That's a tell. That's a tell, yeah. that's a red or flag. That, that is like alarm bell sirens should have gone off. That should have been the end of this crisis. And that was a full year before I was involved in this in, in this story. So, so when you began drawing attention, what, what was the reaction? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I, once I heard about the possibility of lead and water, you know, like I said, it, it, there, was, there was no going back, there was only going forward, and I conducted the research, which is kind of detailed in this book, to see what was happening to our children, to see if our children were increasingly being exposed to the lead, uh, then very publicly shared this research, which is not something you do in academia, you, you publish yeah, and present. Yeah, not typically, right. right. So I, but I shared it at a press conference because our children did not have another It wasn't peer-reviewed, you just hadn't you gone knew it was period, too important. So to... It was an academic no-no, so I, I literally, <laughs> literally walked out of my clinic and I stood up at a press conference oh, um, wow. to, to share this research. That's brave. 
Um, it, but there was no other option. Well, this is no what right this do. is what had to be done. Um, and right away, um, just like everybody else who had raised concerns, moms and pastors and activists and journalists and water scientists, just like everybody else, um, I, I was dismissed and attacked. Why? Do, why do you think, though? I mean, there's a crescendo of. I'm not going to use the word, but, but coming to people's attention. What, why wasn't... You know, that's like the... Why weren't the public health officials and the officials that's paying a, attention and not dismissing? That, that's a great question, and, and that's why we have ongoing efforts at accountability and justice. Those investigations are, are ongoing to this date um, in terms of why did this happen, why weren't people paying attention, and why was public health and children's health not the foremost rather than... Than, than saving dollars. Well, there are a lot of critics of what happened in Flint who say that this was about race. Mm -hmm. And your book, I think, sort of explores that link between environmental justice and social justice in really profound ways. Can you unpack that for our audience a little bit? Absolutely. So the, the concept of environmental injustice is the recognition that people who are poor and people who are predominantly minority disproportionately suffer from the burden of environmental contaminations. This is not a new concept. It's been really kind of well established for about three decades and, and, and well studied throughout this nation uh, of, of kind of crises that happen or, or burdens that happen predominantly on poor and black people. Um, and Flint is another egregious example and probably kind of the most profound in, in this young century of what of an environmental injustice. Uh, many investigations have been done, including um, an investigation from the Michigan Civil Rights Commission, as well as the governor's own task force that clearly say that this was another case of environmental injustice, where the race and the demographics of the population um, perpetuated this crisis. Other um, folks, for example, um, Michael Moore, who's from Flint, uh, Jesse Jackson and others have said, clearly said that this is a racial crisis, that it never would have happened in a richer or a wider community. Are there people who would dispute that now? I mean, it's obvious and clear to, to us. I don't think so. I think it's been well established, and there's By been now. yeah, and there's been also many kind of academic articles and other folks that have um, that have lended kind of their wisdom and also shared that yes, this is in a form of environmental injustice um, that that continues and and is not once again isolated to Flint. The, these are things that are happening throughout our nation, uh, where poor and minority folks disproportionately suffer from environmental contamination. That's because of the zip codes where they live and, and the legacy of, of industry in certain areas. And is yeah, that not I think a kind of lack of political voice, um, industry's ability to manipulate those communities um, and to, for example, put polluting factories or what have you in those environments. Um, so it, it goes back to the title of what the eyes don't see. These are populations that we choose not to see and thus choose not to value, and they disproportionately suffer from these things. Wait, where does your personal sense of justice and injustice come from? Yeah, so I think if you if you pick up this book um, and you think it's a Flint book, I think you'll be taken aback because it's not just a Flint book. Um, you know, this book weaves very much my kind of my personal story and my family history, and I felt that it was important for the readers to to know who I am, um, to understand that what I do and why I do it is really rooted in my deep kind of family upbringing and, and sense of justice. Um, so that means that this book is very much an immigrant story. Um, I'm a first generation immigrant, came to this country when. When I was four years old. From uh, from where? Uh, we were Iraqi American. Um, so I was actually born in the UK. My father was getting his PhD there, but the plan was to go back to Baghdad, where my family is from. Um, but that was the rise of Saddam Hussein. Um, and my parents could not go back to a country um, that was um, that where they were seeing really the effects of, of injustice uh, back home, uh, the rise of fascism and tyranny and oppression and dictatorship. Um, so my parents decided to move to the States, and we, we came to this country for what everybody comes to this country for as immigrants, for freedom and opportunity and democracy for that American dream. And I absolutely wake up every single day fortunate um, to be a recipient of that American dream, um, but also acutely aware of what injustice can be. And my parents never shielded me from what was happening back home. Um, I acutely remember, um, and this is described in the book, um, I think I was 11 or 12, 12 years old, and my father um, was trying to kind of devour anything that was in the news about Iraq, and, and there was not much in the news at that time. And um, he would have memberships and subscriptions to like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, and he shared with me a picture from the massacre in Halepja. If you remember, in northern Iraq, Saddam Hussein poisoned an entire village of his own people, a Kurdish population. 
5,000 people died that day. And he showed me this picture of this beautiful baby girl wrapped in a pink blanket with her father, both of them dead on the street. Um, that is kind of the milieu of how I grew up, um, recognizing that people in power um, can do terrible things to populations that they don't, they don't. Boy, is that not true historically and today as well. Absolutely. There's another major issue that Flint brings to the surface and you, and you write about and would like you to talk about too, and that's the infrastructure of this country today. Yeah. Water supplies, yeah. bridges, roads, railroads. We can go through a litany of, I mean, just drive anywhere, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, that is why this story is also not an isolated to Flint story, because it also very much speaks to the disintegration of our critical infrastructure due to inequality and austerity. We think that our roads and our bridges are bad. What's underneath is is even worse and has not had significant investment, um, specifically in regards to lead in our plumbing. Um, it, it's, it's even hard to believe that we actually have a neurotoxin delivering our drinking water throughout this country. Um, not until 1986 did we restrict the use of lead service lines, which are the pipes that go from the water main to the front yeah, of the house, yeah. but not until 2014 did we restrict the use of lead in fixtures and faucets. Well, a lot of those lead pipes are still there. No, they're mean, still they're there. They're like everywhere. Still. They're, they're everywhere, especially in the Northeast and the Midwest, uh, in older cities. Um, I was in Philadelphia a few months ago, and they had a water main break. Uh, they dug up the water main. They're like, oh, this was installed when Calvin Coolidge was president. Yeah. Um, so that is throughout our nation, and we really need um, massive investment in infrastructure. And I'm, I'm hopeful that this is something that, that can be bipartisan supported and can then also reap the benefits of, of employment and other opportunities. So give us an update. What's the status of water in Flint now? Yeah, so Flint is is doing that infrastructure work, which is amazing. So for the 18 months that we were on this corrosive water that ate up our pipes, um, that damaged our pipes, and those pipes are being replaced right now, which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, that will be done in a few months, and then we'll be the only the third city in the country that has replaced their lead service lines, which is phenomenal. Um, but while we're doing that infrastructure, earth-moving work, um, it requires people to remain on precautions with filtered water and bottled water because of the disruption disruption that can happen in the lead scale uh, during that work, and, and that's why people are still on the precautions right now. You talked about the possibility of a bipartisan effort to rebuild the infrastructure. Do you think that's realistic now in this current climate? And we could describe in detail the current climate, but I think we know what the current climate is, where <laughs> there aren't a lot of people necessarily, <laughs> necessarily Washington are paying attention to that as opposed to uh, a wall. Yeah, you know, um, I think infrastructure, unlike things like immigration and healthcare, um, is something that that both sides can agree is important for all their constituents. It's, it's something that constituents and, and communities all over need investment in. Um, so I see that as something that's more favorable than other kind of very polarizing topics that we are dealing with right now in the nation. But because a lot of this is not happening at the federal level, we're seeing a lot of innovation and creativity and leadership at the state and local levels. And that has been reaffirming. For example, Michigan, um, because of the lessons of Flint, um, has a new a lead and copper rule um, at the state level, which is mandating that all of our pipes in the state be replaced in the next 20 years. So there have been some really positive Flint ripple effects, um, but have that have really kind of resonated at the local state levels because of federal kind of inaction paralysis. Well, I guess half, you know, half a loaf is better than none, right? The local and regional level. You describe in the book, though, sort of your surprise uh, when one of your partners in ex exposing what was happening in Flint turned out to be a conservative Republican. Mm -hmm. okay. So there's, there's more to it than, than, than just sort of meets the eye. Yeah, so, and that is absolutely one of the reasons I wrote this book, because we are in this really bizarre, divisive state of our nation right now. Um, and this is a story of how unexpected people came together. People of different ideologies, of different backgrounds, of different professions came together on behalf of our children. And that is a story that we need right now. I mean, yes, the story of Flint is, is a story of a crime committed with absolute indifference against some of the most vulnerable people. But it is also how everyday people um, from all over, moms and pastors and activists and students and, and teachers and doctors and scientists and water folks came together from very, very different and diverse back backgrounds um, to find something that they, that, that they all could rally towards. Um, and that's an important lesson that we need right now, especially in this really divisive state that we're in. 
So uh, we discuss a lot of issues on the show on a weekly basis. Some are international, some are, are national. And a question we often ask our guests is if you, the viewer or listener of the show, is concerned about the issues we've talked about today, what would you advise? What can the quote unquote ordinary citizen do? Yeah, so I, you know, this book is, um, it's very much a Flint book. The story is very much kind of about what happened in Flint and, and kind of a call to action for all of us to kind of be aware and alert and recognize what's happening in our communities. And a lot of people go away and they're like, oh, I want to help Flint. And if you want to help Flint, great. You know, you could donate to our Flint Kids Fund, which is one of the reasons I wrote this book. Part of the proceeds go back to that, oh, that fund, flintkids.org. But, but by and large, I tell folks, you do not need to come to Flint. You do not need to help Flint. You just need to find something that, that you're passionate about Turn on the news. Every, there are injustices happening right around us. We cannot afford to have a society with their eyes closed and silent to the injustices. Um, kids at the border separated from their parents, our inaction on climate change, on gun violence, the constant threats to social safety net programs, healthcare, rising drug prices, the, you know, slavery morphed into mass incarceration. You pick it, you pick what's passionate and put your energy towards that. And that is something that, that everybody can do and, and can do today. We just need an engaged citizenship. Wow. That's a hell of a point. Um, yeah, no kidding. So we've got about 30 seconds left. What's next for you? Retirement. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, um, I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> you know, I, I, I am privileged. I feel blessed to have this amazing microphone to be able to advocate, and, you know, especially with this book, to be able to advocate not only for Flint children, but children all over, because the stories are not isolated. There are kids all over this nation who really wake up to some of the same nightmares of our Flint kids, be it poverty, injustice, austerity, lost democracy, stolen opportunity. And I will continue to, to do kind of my part to make sure that kids throughout this country have the best opportunity. And the country's right going to be better for it. Dr. Mona Hanna-Tisha, thank you so much for being with us. The book is What the Eyes Don't See. You should check it out. That's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org, where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.